Uh, thank you everybody for joining us for the uh, Masters in Reading virtual information session. Uh, my name is Tom Crash. I am the Director of Graduate Admissions. Really appreciate everybody joining us. Um, normally I, around this time of the year, I would be saying, you know, you're giving up like a nice, beautiful day, you know, appreciate you spending time with us, though we still appreciate it. Um, yeah, the, the weather and, and for those of you who are in Eastern Pennsylvania, or you're probably dealing with the, some of the smoke. Um, but either way, again, thank you for joining us. Uh, we have a great event planned. The event should take probably around 30, between 30 and 40 minutes, I would say. Um, we're going to start off with a presentation, um, and then we will open up the questions. But if you have questions throughout the presentation, please don't hesitate to ask. You can just put them into the Q&A, and I will get them through our faculty members. Uh, but before we go any further, if everybody wouldn't mind introducing themselves, uh, maybe how long you've been at, at Bloomsburg and you know, your, your background in your area of, of you know, academic interest. And we can start with Dr. Bonomo. So I'm Dr. Bonomo. I've been at Bloomsburg since 2009. I teach in the graduate reading program, of course, and then I teach two courses in the undergraduate reading uh, program, a practicum, and then a reading uh, specific assessment course. Right now, my research interest has turned to teacher effectiveness, and I am uh, currently working on some uh, research and information on increasing teacher effectiveness through professional development. Excellent. And were you a former teacher in the classroom? I taught for 13 years in K-1-2, uh, and then I was a literacy coach, a reading specialist and a literacy coach for about four years. Awesome. Okay, great. I have a kindergartner right now, so I I always appreciate our, our, our kindergarten teachers. That's a, that's a tough job. Yeah. You're tired at the end of the day, for sure. I, you know, I'm tired after but a few hours, and, and I only have, <laughs> only have one of them, so I can only imagine. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Roberts. Hi, I'm Dr. Diana Sheree Roberts. I go by Sheree, my middle name. When Dr. Bonomo said what year she started, it's like, I don't know what year I started. <laughs> I've been here at Bloom about 18 years now. Mm -hmm. um, prior to that, I taught second grade for 15 years and loved every single moment of it. I think what I enjoyed most was the teaching of reading. I'm uh, a certified reading specialist. I went through the Bloomsburg University program way back when. And currently I teach undergrad and graduate students. I'm the graduate coordinator. So, you know, if you're interested in applying to the program, I would be your advisor as well as the person that you would, well, I'm your advisor. We'll just put it at that. <laughs> it's easier to, to say it that way. So Great, I have a variety you. of courses I teach, not just reading, but a lot of it is reading. Great. Thank you. And now Dr. Terwilliger. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Karen Terwilliger, Dr. Terwilliger, Dr. T, whatever uh, <laughs> folks are comfortable with. And I am an, a graduate of Bloomsburg University, now Commonwealth University. And I'm at the Bloomsburg campus. I um, started teaching um, at on the campus in 2002. And um, I'm, I love the program. I have benefited from a program, but we've even made it better for you all. Uh, we've been doing some updates. Um, I've um, taught uh, elementary for 10 years. I taught in Baltimore County schools. I've also taught in more rural areas as well. And um, I do have experience also working with English learners. And that is one of my interests is culturally relevant, sustaining uh, pedagogies. And that's something we definitely address in the graduate program, but also in the undergrad program. Um, I teach a multicultural ed class, but um, we'll uh, do those kinds of things also in the grad reading program. In my teaching experience of 10 years, um, I taught all the content areas and literacy was woven throughout everything that we did. So um, I'm, I'm happy to be um, part of this program and to meet you all. All right, great. Thank you, everybody. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here so we can kick off the presentation. Of course, I have this beautiful picture of McCormick, which is where um, you know, the, the College of Education is, is typically located. However, it's being renovated right now. And anyways, this program is predominantly going to be online anyways. However, it was a nice photo. I figured I would drop that one in there. But, you know, the, the probably the most important question, the, the most important slide here is why would someone want to go into the, you know, to, to go into the program to complete the Master's of Reading, Dr. Roberts? Well, a lot of people are interested in learning other techniques, other ideas to bring into their classroom, not necessarily because they want to be a reading specialist, but they just want to kind of freshen up what it is that they're doing in the classroom. But there are a good number of people who apply who are looking to get that extra certification. You know, they might want to do the master's degree, but they're looking for the extra certification that will 
uh, make them more marketable. Mm -hmm. If they are looking to change their what it is that they're doing in the classroom, if they want to go to the next level and be the reading specialist at their school or looking to change to another school, uh, we have a number of students who come in who are um, substitute teachers and they just want to get that extra boost and extra edge that should a position open up. Uh, they have this reading specialist certification and master's degree to go with it. Other people want to use the program towards their Act 48 credits. We know we have to gather so many of those every five years and you can actually use the credits towards that requirement that PDE has. Mm -hmm. Some people also use it towards their Instructional two certification. They take, uh, rather than, well, I should say taking credits, but rather than taking um, something that doesn't go towards a master degree, just random courses, they want to centralize what it is that they're doing. And I guess that kind of goes towards their Act 48 as well. Dr. Bonomo, Dr. Twilliger, anything to add? Nope, okay. Well, just, Dr. Twilliger and Dr. Bonomo, I think you said that you're both graduates of the program. Mm -hmm. No, okay, I so, graduated from Lock Haven, but- Oh, okay, that was- Now, yeah. now all part of Commonwealth. Yeah, yeah, that was serendipitous there. Um, so when you decided to go back, what was your reason for, for going back for, for the program? I went back because at the at that time I was teaching K-1-2 and our district was going through a change in um, curriculum and we were taking all of that we were teaching by the standards and so one of the biggest uh, holes that we had in our program our elementary um, our up uh, our school district had eight elementary schools three high schools and two middle schools. And at that point we hadn't combined any schools yet. So there were eight elementary schools in our district and all of them had holes in the reading uh, area. And so the curriculum coordinator at the time encouraged me to go back and do a reading specialist because she wanted me to work with reading teachers and do literacy coaching activities. So that's why I originally went back. Um, it was more district based. It was more need based. So they they had a need in the district and they wanted me to fill it. So that's why I went back and, and got my reading. But um, it really has benefited me in so many areas. I stayed in the classroom far more far longer than I thought I would. Um, but it helped me as a teacher, just understanding the concepts of reading. And especially, you know, now with the science of reading being coming in and we're, we're renovate or renewing and changing some of our programs, um, revising to make sure that we're including those. I think that's going to be something that our program can really benefit um, students coming out because we're already looking at making those changes. Um, but I, I think as a teacher, especially in the pre-K four, if you're not a if you're not proficient at teaching reading, your children will struggle, your children in the classroom. So I think it's really important, even if you decide to just do Act 48, take the reading courses. That's what I encourage our students to do. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Tuller. Yes, I uh, completed my undergraduate at Bloomsburg University, and then I did gain my uh, doctoral, uh, not at Bloomsburg, but at Penn State. And I chose specifically a uh, literacy track because just as Dr. Bonomo was saying, reading and liter literacy, reading, writing, listening, and speaking, it's in everything. And um, all the content areas, it seemed the most beneficial. I was doing that while I was also teaching elementary. So what I was learning, I could be applying right away in um, my teaching and really see uh, the gains and bring some of my experiences into the classroom. So that I, I really benefited from that. And um, the students did certainly, of course, uh, as well. I also got my master's degree in reading from Bloomsburg University, and I found that when I was a first-year teacher that this was way back when we ability grouped, and because I was going through the program at the time, I wasn't certified just yet, they were giving me students that had a lot of the struggling readers and I found that being in the program really helped with that. And then eventually we got away from ability grouping, mm -hmm. but I was still able to use those skills with all levels of students in my classroom. So it's been a benefit all the way around. And now 
as a college professor, I'm continuing to use those skills or what I have learned and what I have gained to prepare future teachers, you know, giving them the tidbits in the background when it comes to, to reading instruction. Yeah, I would imagine reading is probably maybe like the foundational core of, of education. You know, I mean, it, it'd be hard to do much else without being able to, to read. So that's that's good to know. Um, then just the high level overview of the program, what, what might students experience? Well, the program is 30 credits total if you go for the entire master's degree. I believe there's another slide coming up in a little bit that talks about how it's broken into two parts. It is 100% online. There is, well, sort of the caveat there. We do have a practicum experience that is face-to-face, -face, but there are options. If you live a certain distance from the university, you could do the practical experience in your school. There are some requirements to do that, and that would be either a fall or a spring semester that you would do that. Otherwise, if you live within a certain mileage of the university, you would participate in the practicum experience that takes place in the summer. We, uh, Dr. Bonomo does this practical experience where you work with students in a local school district. And so that benefits our local schools to the Bloomsburg area and local meaning Bloomsburg at the time. Mm -hmm. I have also found that because the program is 100% online, it really gives tremendous uh, flexibility for students to enroll in this program. Um, not all of the students that are in the program, but many are teaching right now. So that allows that flexibility being online, uh, cuts out the travel. Um, some of the, the course that I teach is um, asynchronous. So it also allows that flexibility of completing the work within uh, set deadlines a kind of a window uh, for getting feedback and uh, completing assignments and communicating um, on online discussions with peers. And the I was gonna, ask, I'm sorry, I was gonna ask that question too. When we talk about the courses being online, are they synchronous or asynchronous predominantly? What, what's a normal course going to be like? They are all, other than the practical experience, they are all asynchronous. Um, I know the courses that I have set up, I have them set up in modules so that you, have things that you are working on in a block over the course of the semester so that it's not like everything comes at you at once and you're not trying to cram everything at once because we know the best way to learn is to learn things in small increments and review and to build upon that as we go. So that's how the courses are set. And I even the master's degree level courses, the two courses we have there, they are also online. Um, the one research course has options of being asynchronous or synchronous. So you do have an option of either one mm -hmm. for that, but the majority of them are asynchronous. And one of the things I will say though, if I could jump in is that I know, you know, Dr. Terwilliger and Dr. Roberts and I, we will be available during the semester. We have office hours, of course, during the day for our undergraduate students, but we also are available upon request. So you know, I always have hours for my students and I've had many, many conversations on a Saturday afternoon yeah. because we know that our students are working um, as we are working too, you know, during the day. And so a lot of times they'll email me and say, you know, I need to meet with you about this assignment. I'm not quite clear. And then we set up a, a time at their convenience and our convenience and we discuss that. And a lot of times, you know, we lay out our, our assignments pretty well but we're laying those assignments out based on our understanding of the curriculum and we understand what's expected. And when a student looks at that, sometimes it can be confusing. And so we encourage our students, and I, I know that other professors, um, especially Dr. Terwilliger and Dr. Roberts, do the same thing. You know, contact me if there's questions, because sometimes you need to just talk it through. And we're, we do that quite a bit. So if students, even though it's asynchronous, they shouldn't feel like they're out there just kind of doing this course on their own. Um, we are available to them pretty much all the time. And I'll also add, thank you so much, Dr. Bonomo, for adding that in. Yeah, we are definitely available. Um, even though this is something that's flexible with being asynchronous, I know in the course that I teach, and I'm, I'm certain that the two of you as well, um, there are opportunities for you to, to meet your classmates and to have online chats and discussions and sharing of what's going on, particularly if you're in a district now, 
what's your reading program, um, what's happening there. So there's a lot of learning that occurs between peers as well because of those discussions. Mm -hmm. I agree. I've, I've noticed that in my classes as well with the, the discussion boards and you know, sharing of information across. And it's like, you know, everyone's nice to see, you know, what everyone else is doing somewhere else. It's it's good to hear that. Uh, one thing that I see that's on this particular slide is a lot of people ask, when can I start the program? And we have it set up where you could start in the summer or the fall semester. Uh, that is because some of the uh, courses that are in the spring semester are better if you have some coursework under your belt before you get into those courses. So starting in the summer or the fall semesters would be the best time to start. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if we have a slide later that actually talks about that or not. Um, I'll hold on that for now. So I don't wanna repeat information. Yeah, it seems like the, the big takeaway here is that I mean, this is a program that's built for working teachers basically. Right. Um, and I think that the convenience is a big part of that, too, because this is a big commitment to make and having that convenience there is important. And I guess maybe I will speak to that now because a lot that you brought that up, a lot of um, people coming into the program or who are interested in the program want to know, well, how many credits do I have to take? And the number of credits that you are um, limited to is 12 in a semester. Nine is considered full time, but you can take one class if you want in a semester. And so that becomes more of, you know, a personal, you know, idea. And a lot of people will start out with just one class to see can they handle the one class, get their feet wet, you know, can they mix this with work and family life and taking a course. And once they become comfortable, they might add on, you know, taking more credits in a semester than just three credits. Yeah. yeah, and all the courses are three credits except the practical experience, which is a six credit course. And that's kind of a nice um, segue into uh, a couple of the different options. So the program is offered both as a degree and just as the, the special certification. Right. I'm going to talk to the reading specialist certification. That's the part on the bottom. That is the main component of the whole program. You'll see that it's 24 credits. You can, if you want, you can go just for the reading specialist certification, take the, do the 24 credits, then take the, the praxis exam that is required by PDE to become certified. The certification then goes on to your teaching certificate. Once you finish those 24 credits or while you're going, it's it's up to you, you could go and continue and get your master's degree. And that's only two more classes. Mm -hmm. It's six credits more. And it just makes it a lot easier if you want to go for the whole the whole thing, the 20, the 30 credits altogether. And people always ask me, why, why would I want to do just the reading specialist and not the whole thing? Some people are, like I said before, substituting, and they want to do just the reading specialist cert, become certified, get that on their certificate, make themselves more marketable. And then they hope that they are hired by a school that would help them finish off the rest, you know, the six credits and help them financially get the others. And that's usually the reason they would only go for the reading specialist, the main reason. I have had a couple, very few, who want the reading specialist only because they have a master's degree in something else and they really don't need another master's degree. That tends to be few and far between, but that has been, you know, a reason for doing just the reading specialist and not the entire master's degree program. Yeah. And then that gets us to the, the coursework then. Those are all the courses for the entire program, that would be the master's degree program. The ones, um, the, the intro to reading course is probably one or maybe the second course, depending on when you start. If you start in the summer, you would do reading in the content areas. That's a course that I teach. Uh, in the fall, uh, that would be one of the first courses you would do would be the introduction to the teaching of reading. There's not a real, order, should I say, 
to the program per se. There are some courses on here that are, like you can see the second course, the reading assessment and intervention course is something that we strongly recommend you take before you participate in the practicum, only because the materials that are covered there by Dr. Bonomo are um, assessments and interventions that will be applied during the practical experience. And there are four courses that are prerequisites that you need to take prior to you know, being part of the practical experience. That would be the introduction to the teaching of reading, the reading assessment course, mm -hmm. reading in the content areas, and the early language learning to guided reading. Those are the, the basic courses that you definitely would need background information that you would use and apply when you go into the practical experience. And then the educational research and writing and the teaching writing for grades four to 12, those are the two courses that are for the master's degree. So you can go through and take the ones all above with the practicum, that's your reading specialist program. And then the master's degree would be the, the final two. If you are interested in doing the whole program, you can put in the research course and the teaching of writing courses in at any time. You do not have to finish, you know, the reading specialist first and then do the master's. You can kind of pull those in whenever you would like. And anyone want to talk top? Yeah, let me get my mouth going here. Anyone want to talk specifically about their particular course? Dr. Bonomo, I know you have the reading assessment. You have several courses in here. So um, I teach early language learning. I teach organization and administration of reading programs. And I teach the assessment course. And so, and then I teach the practicum. So those courses, other than the reading and the content area, which I think, Dr. Terwilliger, do you teach that? I content teach reading in the content oh, area. Okay, Dr. Uh, Roberts teaches that. So those are the three courses that you need to have before the practicum experience. And so within those courses, we have built in assessments um, for competencies. And so that's why those three particular courses are so important to have before the practicum, because the practicum experience is really um, the experience where you're using all of the things that you've learned in those courses, including the administration and organization, because you have to come up with some planning um, and work collaboratively with your colleagues in that area. I will say, since we talked about the option for the practicum, I don't know how many people from out of the area are with us tonight or who will see this um, webinar, but that practicum experience as an internship um, is can also be just as valuable. So I don't want anyone to take away that if they're not doing the practicum on site, that they're, they're not getting the full experience because we do have um, things in place to make sure that you do get the supervision from a reading specialist um, and that one of us supervises you during that experience as well. And we give you just as much support. So I want to make clear that that is just as good of an experience. It's not like, oh, we're just going to do this because you're not in the in the area. So I wanted to make that clear because I do have students doing that actually this summer. So and the internship, if um, it's in the fall or spring semester and you are doing it in your own school, that's where you would do it in your own school district. You have an opportunity to work with your reading specialist mm -hmm. in, uh, as, as them being your mentor. And you are able to see what it is that they do, you know, rather than being in your classroom and how what you are doing in your classroom can apply, you know, not only as a reading specialist, but to help those struggling readers within your classroom. So it's a, it's a nice working relationship if you do the internship. The uh, course that I'm teaching is the literacy, literature, literacy, and culture, and I have that pretty much divided up into different modules that Dr. Roberts was talking about. And in that course, we um, explore culture and how it influences teaching as well as learning for the teacher, but also for the students. Um, also, selecting and using quality literature um, and sharing that out with your peers and exchanging um, how it might be utilized in the classroom. Um, culturally sustaining literacy practices, 
Um, so, you know, investigating different um, strategies for uh, that are literature um, skills um, in reading, writing, listening, or speaking, and again, sharing those with peers um, so that you're not only researching yourself, but you're hearing what your peers have also um, to be learning. Um, things that you can take into your future classroom or to your current classroom. Um, also language acquisition. I know I mentioned that I work with English learners. So if you have an English learner in your class, how do you um, engage them in literacy practices? How do you differentiate for those students? And then what are just resources for literacy? Um, those are things that we also look into um, that are online, um, that can be um, utilized in your classrooms um, and also shared uh, amongst uh, the class uh, in your peers. So those are just some of the things that we cover in that class. And the reading in the content areas, I wanna speak to that one. That's one of the ones that I teach. That one is showing that reading is just not like Tom had mentioned before, that reading is just not specific to the reading language arts block. That reading is needed everywhere, math, science, social studies. And some of the courses, not just the reading and the content, I know some of the courses, yes, they are specific to our people going for reading specialists, but we have people who are going for their special ed degree and they are taking some of these courses. And that makes it nice because you are getting different perspectives from people going for different master's degrees. So it's not just the people in reading. So you get to hear those ideas and perspectives as you go through the various courses. Now, some of the courses are specific just to the master's in reading program, but not all of them are. Great, thank you. In addition to the coursework, um, you know, applying the theory to, to practice here, would you be able to walk us through some of the, you know, some of the high impact practices here? Um, some of the ones that I do in my content reading class, they are actually, coming up with a reading strategy. And when they create the reading strategy, they are creating it for a specific content area and not just reading. They can actually pick their content area. And it's interesting to see how they will show how to use the strategy in a math class or a science or social studies. Right now I have someone, I'm having the courses going right now, who is a Spanish teacher. And they're talking about how they are using some of these projects or strategies with teaching Spanish of all things. <laughs> so it's interesting when they're saying, you know, it's, it's you know, a lot of content areas. It's just not the reading class. Would you be able to talk a little bit about the, the, the practicum? What does a, a day look like in, in the practicum? So, it, so um, just to circle back to course embedded projects, um, we do, um, if there's availability for local school districts, we do a literacy night uh, that our students are involved in planning and um, presenting to parents and providing resources for parents in one of the courses. Um, in another course, uh, the assessment course, the students do case studies where they uh, learn assessment and then they use those assessments with one or two particular children that they choose to work with. And they provide, uh, they basically do a case study, which is um, pre-assessment, post-assessment analysis, and then they share that data out. Um, for the practicum, essentially, if it is run as a practicum, we participate with Memorial Elementary School, which is in Bloomsburg School District. We've also participated with Central Columbia Middle School uh, with some of the fourth graders moving into fifth grade who might be below grade level and not ready to go to fifth grade for their reading skills. Um, we've had our students work with those pre-fifth graders in the summer. And so typically what happens is it's typically 8.30 to 12.30, uh, three days a week and uh, one day for clerical. So we usually use our Mondays because most of the time we like to give students Fridays um, for clerical information, doing um, uh, data sheets and looking at data for our students, but they work collaborative, collaboratively as a team uh, with an assigned group of students. Um, and they take them through uh, reading, writing, word study and, and workshop uh, or silent reading. And so they rotate. The students are there for about two hours. They come in um, and they you typically have the same group every 
um, morning or every day that they work with, um, but the teachers will rotate uh, in the groups and teach certain skills. Um, and so you're with students about two hours and then after the students leave, then you work collaboratively looking at data, seeing if you need to, to change groups around. Um, and then um, I observe students throughout the week on different things, specifically just the reading portion, just the writing. How are they teaching their writing? Um, how are they working with students to encourage reading engagement in the silent self-selected reading phase of it? Um, because a lot of times we look at students reading on their own as, as not something that's um, looked at as an instructional piece, but it really can be. Um, so we, we look at that portion as well. Um, and then, um, you know, students work to change curriculum or change assessments. And then at the end of the semester or at the end of the practicum experience, they provide summary sheets and resource sheets for parents to show their child, to show the parent, this is where the child was. This is what we've done. These are some of the skills and strategies that they've learned. Um, these are still some challenges for them, but here are some resources for you to, to help your child. So that's essentially what the practicum looks like. Uh, the internships look however uh, they're going to look in their particular school at that time. Something that I'd like to point out that Dr. Bonomo alluded to, she said they worked with the middle school. And I don't think I mentioned this at the beginning, but when you go for your reading specialist certification, it's a K to 12 certification mm -hmm. that you could be a reading specialist in you know, elementary, middle or high school. So that's the nice thing about the certification. Mm -hmm. And that's something too, when we were working with the middle school, we did have students seventh and eighth grade that were there for science and math. Um, but during that particular time, the principal did come to us and say, hey, you know, we are here for science and math, but I think they could use some reading instruction. And so we ended up revamping some of our groups and we provided opportunity for those students to come to a half hour rotation of reading instruction. And we worked on comprehension and fluency and things that we felt that that we could help them with at that time. So it's a really good experience. Um, you know, it is a good lump of your time during the summer, but it is really you know, a great way for us to see that you've taken what you've learned in your coursework and now that you can apply it. Because essentially as a reading specialist or a literacy coach in your in your building, you really are the person people are going to go to. And so you we really want to make sure that you're fully prepared to do that. Speaking of the lump of time, how much time is it in the summer? <laughs> well, it's typically six weeks, um, three days a week and one day for clerical. So um, if we're needed to be in session for clerical, if students want to get together personally and have me there to help them with data, then we meet Monday through Thursday. But if they feel like they can work in their groups, either virtually or however they want to work, then I usually let them use their Mondays, you know, virtually with each other and myself. Um, so it's six weeks, four days a week from eight to 12 which is a big lump of time. <laughs> yeah, and I think you made a good point too, Dr. Bernomo, where uh, you might be one of a few people in, in the building or in the school where like that know, has this skill set. So this, this is important in these, you know, these high impact practices are, are designed so that way when you graduate, you're ready to hit the ground running, right? You're ready to be the person able to, to do this. And a lot of times because of lack of resources, they'll send their literacy coach or their reading specialist to conferences to come back and teach or train. So that's where that ONA course comes in, where we're really talking about how do you how do you train other people with the skills that you have? How do you present and how do you train and how do you provide opportunities to coach in the classroom? And so the most of my courses are assessment based. Um, and so that's kind of where um I focus my attention is getting them ready to understand the assessment and then also be able to teach it and support teachers in the classroom. Great, thank you. Then career options. So it, it goes beyond, I um, mean, you know, obviously, you know, being a, a teacher is, is one of the options, um, but it's not the only option. So uh, Dr. Roberts, could you walk us through some of the, the outcomes here that students might be able to engage in? Well, I'm going to, specifically talk about you know being the reading specialist it's that seems to be what most people want to go to be they want to be that person that's working in the the school to be the reading specialist to help those children who are struggling with readers who are struggling with reading i should say 
Uh, also, the reading instructor or teacher, some people want to go in just as a classroom teacher, just to have an, an extra set of skills, extra skill set in order to help them in the classroom, because we all have students that are going to be struggling readers or even what to do with those students who are the advanced readers and how to keep them engaged and how to keep them going. Um, Dr. Bonoma, I'll let you talk about the literacy coach and things like that, if you would, please. Sure. So um, curriculum developer and literacy coach kind of go together. Um, so when I was a literacy coach for my school district, one of the primary responsibilities that I had was working with the administration on curriculum development for the reading programs in the school district. And so you are working on developing curriculum for your population. So lots of curriculum programs will come down the pike and people will review those and the administration may come to you and say, these are the programs we're looking at, can you take a look at them? And then you have valuable input as to whether your population would benefit them. You know, is your population um, from, full support homes? Um, do they struggle to get support at home? Are they a uh, transient community where the kids come in and then they leave again and they come back? So looking at your population of students and be able, being able to direct, develop curriculum with the administration and share with your teachers. The one thing that's really positive about that is as the literacy coach, you have more access to your teachers and their uh, data in the classroom. And so you have a better understanding of what curriculum the teachers are comfortable with and what they buy into. Um, so you have a better uh, on the ground looking at teacher buy-in and what the teachers will actually be willing to do for professional development for that curriculum. So that's a really important point because one of the things um, that teachers will say is, is a detriment is given a, a program that they don't understand or they can't do and they're expected to do it. Um, if they're willing to do the professional development, that gives you a leg up to get what's best for the students pretty much immediately. So, so you're really kind of an in-between sometimes with the administration and uh, the faculty with curriculum planning. So that's an important part. As a literacy coach, you're developing relationships with teachers um, and you're going in and you're coaching and you're modeling uh, new strategies or new skills for those teachers and giving them assistance and coaching in the classroom, more support in the classroom. So like a typical day, I may go into three different classrooms and teach a new um, way to teach um, uh, fluency, or I may model how to do a read aloud, or I may model how to do word work with a, with a group of students. I may help teachers um, break students up into groups based on their either their ability level, um, if we're looking at skills and strategies, or if we're looking at reading level. So you're kind of a hands-on coach in the classroom. Um, and one of the other responsibilities that you have sometimes as a literacy coach is training. So you will go to a lot of trainings and you will come back and train teachers, whether it's faculty meetings, giving presentations, or presenting at in, uh, in-service days, or a day that the, the administration has set aside for you to do um, some training and some coaching. So you do have a lot of input uh, as a literacy coach or curriculum developer. Um, and so what our goal is at Bloomsburg is to really prepare you and understanding reading programs, understanding how to build relationships, because that's really important as well. Yeah, great, thank you. One of our best and brightest from, from the program, um, Dr. Robert, you'll be able to, to walk us through the, the experience of uh, Alana, Marlena. Alana is uh, getting near the end of her program. I believe she is doing her practical experience this summer. Mm -hmm. And she, as you can read what she said, she is a first grade teacher. And a lot of what she's been learning and in our program, she's actually been able to apply to her first grade classroom. And as you notice, she said, it's been very flexible. I can't remember how long um, she's been in the program because of the flexibility. Sometimes they take one, sometimes they take two. But uh, as she's noted, you know, we're there to support them as you go through your program, depending upon how you want to take the courses and when you want to take them. And as Dr. Bonomo pointed out, you know, not that we're there 24 seven, <laughs> we are available, you know, outside of the normal school day. You know, we work in the evenings or the weekends, whatever would work best 
to have a, a quick conversation if it's needed. And Alana, Alana just kind of pointed that out. Sorry. <laughs> you don't have to take our word for it, basically. Yeah. And then the application in the admission process. There is um, a place online to, to apply for the graduate program. These are the materials that you would need when you apply. If you are a Bloomsburg graduate or a CU graduate, I think your transcripts are automatically populated in. If you graduated from somewhere else, you would have to you know, send your transcripts in. You do have to type up a letter of intent. Why do you wanna be in our program? What is it that you're looking for? You know, a little bit about yourself. We ask for two letters of professional recommendation from either principals, fellow teachers, supervisors, whoever it is. We do need a copy of your teaching certif certificate. You do need to be a certified teacher to come into our program. That just makes it a lot, well, I think it's a requirement for one, but you're going to be working with children and you need that background classroom information. Just like anything in education or schools, there are clearances that are required. And the last is the interview. That's not an interview to come into the program. Once you are accepted into the program, you will meet with the program coordinator, me, which actually becomes your advisor. And I go through and talk to you about, you know, when the courses are offered, how many classes you want to take. I give you links and background information on how to be successful. We use I have to get this right because we just changed. We use Brightspace or D2L. Uh, it used to be called Bolt, but it's now called Brightspace or D2L. And how to, you know, find your courses there. I give you background information on, you know, if when you go to schedule a class, you'll ask me or send me your list of classes you want to schedule. And I'll say, yeah, that sounds good. Or I might say, you know, you might want to try this instead. So I will talk you through what would be the best way to get through the program with the courses? It's basically on, the application. An onboarding, an onboarding meeting, trying to you yeah. know, get people ready. Yeah, for sure. Right. Great. And finally, contact information for Dr. Robertson. Again, whether you're watching live or you're watching the recording, please don't hesitate to reach out to any of us. We are happy to help in any way that we can. We, and we, we work for you. So we're, we're happy to answer any questions that, that you might have. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and, and stop my share. Um, if the, the group that's watching live has any questions, that's a great time to pose those. Um, I do know one of the, uh, you know, one question I always like to ask um, is from the faculty perspective, what is your favorite class to teach? Like, what's the one that you are most, I mean, I'm sure you're passionate about all the subjects, but if you had to pick one, what's the one do you enjoy the most, Dr. Bonello? Uh, the practicum. Okay. Because a lot of times I see I see student names and I develop relationships with them via conversations on the phone. But when they come into the practicum, I see their faces and I get to see them actually work with students. And that's when I I get to really meet them. So I enjoy the practicum. Great. Uh, Dr. Roberts. It's hard. Right now I'm teaching reading in the content. And I love that because I see like to see the variety of students and how they're making the connections to being not just teaching reading in the reading class, but how it applies elsewhere. But I also like the intro to reading class. You made it hard. I mean, I don't know. I can't give just one. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. I understand. That, that's a good sign, right? Go. Yeah. I enjoy all of them. It's, it's fun working with the graduate students and seeing what it is that they're doing in their classroom. And then it's also wonderful to read it because when I read their discussion boards, they talk about, or in their assignments, they're talking about how, oh, they found this strategy through this course and they're applying it right now in their class, especially in the intro to reading class. Uh, when I do the reading and the content, uh, schools are still in. So I do see some of them getting to apply some of the strategies here at the end of the year. But I've also read in some of their posts like, Oh, I wish I were teaching right now. I have to remember to do this when it comes to the fall, you know, when they come back into the classroom. So it, it's it warms my heart to see that they are, you know, anxious, not anxious. I mean, anxious in a good way, excited right, to exactly. apply what it is that they're learning in the class in the college classroom. I thought you yeah. 
And I would say the same thing, the literature, literacy and culture class, I think a lot of it is reflection on who you are as a person and how that um, shapes you as a teacher and gets you thinking about how you carry yourself into um, what you do and how you interact with your students. But also as um, my colleagues have been sharing, um, things that we do in the class is really to, if you're already a teacher, um, you already have been, you have your undergraduate degree, you have some skills developed, whether it's your teaching experience or maybe you're coming right from your undergrad into your grad program. It's um, like, if you're in a classroom now, um, how have you developed now your skills that you can now revamp something that you've done. What did you do now? How are you changing it up? And then what's the result that you're getting the outcome with the students? So there's a lot of assignments that build off of that or a grade that you would like to teach. Um, I'm learning a lot from students as well because when we select literature, um, teachers will bring in, um, they'll find wonderful literature that they're sharing with their peers, but also it's me. I, I, I get really excited um, to be learning with and from um, the whole group collectively. Um, it's learning never stops. So. I love it. And before we sign off, does anybody have any parting advice for prospective students looking at, at, at a program like this? Um, and any advice as three uh, faculty members who were not only former educators um, in, in K through 12 setting, uh, but also are graduates of an, uh, the MED in, in reading or the doctorate program in, in literacy. Any any guidance you could bestow upon anyone watching the, uh, the video? Dr. Bonomo. I think if they have any pull at all to start a program that they should just go ahead and do it. I had a um a dean once tell me that you don't you don't jump over the fence until you throw your hat over and you have to go get it. And oh, so good. my advice would be throw your hat over and go get it because sometimes we have doubts as teachers as to what we can do or what we should do and if they have any push to do it they should just do it. That's good. Good advice. Uh, Dr. Roberts. I was just thinking that the more you know about reading, the better it's going to help you in the classroom. Sure. Uh, we all have the aha moments when we see the lights go on with their, when their students catch on to something and maybe just getting going through a program and getting refreshed and rejuvenated is mm -hmm. a good thing to do. Sure. Yeah, Dr. Tuliger. You know, I would say too, if you are finishing your undergraduate or you just finished your undergraduate, and you're kind of like, am I getting that job or not? Start a program because that also shows that um, you're interested in developing yourself professionally and reading is an area that all districts are looking for their students to be proficient in. I mean, that's what testing is about. It's, it's reading and reading is in everything. And it really, um, you know, get get started on it. And then if you do get that job, then maybe the school can help you pay for your education. And as far as us, um, graduate assistantships, um, is there anything that we can share about that? Because I think that financial piece is always a concern. Graduate assistantships are available. It's, I found that it's difficult for teachers who are already working mm -hmm. in a school, because to be a graduate assistant, you have to be able to work on campus face-to-face -face, 10 hours a week, you are assigned to a faculty member to do that. But if you are newly graduated and you don't have a job yet, you know, you're doing maybe substitute teaching or something like that, then a graduate assistantship would be very beneficial. The nice thing about a graduate assistantship is they, um, you have to carry at least nine credits a semester you the university will pay for six of those credits not the not those outside fees but the credits itself and you are also given a stipend you can have a graduate assistantship i believe for two years i'm not sure if they've changed that but those are some of the things about a graduate assistantship mm -hmm. and and for any student who might be pursuing this as a full-time student um, a grad assistantship is a great opportunity to kind of offset the cost. Um, so basically a GA means you're a, a part-time employee of the university. Um, so you receive a stipend and like Dr. Roberts said, uh, tuition remission for up to six credits. Um, so I'm sure that we will have some students who will finish their, their bachelor's degree and jump right into the program full-time. That's a good op opportunity. And we have GAs in every department on campus too. We, just in our, you know, in our office alone, the admissions be higher three or four. So um, there's normally a lot of GA positions available. Um, that is a very good point though, Dr. Terwilliger. I forgot about that yesterday, the grad assistantship positions. That's great. 
All right. Well, great. Well, thank you everybody so much. I really appreciate your time. Um, again, if anybody has any questions, if you're watching live or if you're watching the recording, please do not hesitate to reach, reach out to us. We are happy to help. And I hope everybody has a good night. Night. Thank you.